that afternoon in the locker room, I started answering some of the boys' questions. Hey, you having a meeting? No, just talking. Sit down if you want to. Let's see, where was I? Oh, yes. This is how we all came into the world. Well, that's it for today, fellas. not a baby anymore. I know, dear, but, uh... Parents ask, you know, how do I talk about sex? Oh, what you want to know about is sexual intercourse. And, and that conversation, I find, has not gotten any easier over the years. Tonight will be mother and daughter conference night. It's so typically that dreaded moment, you know? They, they put it in, in movies and they're like, oh, we have the talk, you know, we call it the talk. Puberty's a lot of things. Uh, tell no lie, it was awkward. Maybe a diagram will help. You know, like, Dad, why are we having this conversation? I don't want to talk about this. When do you think I'll start having periods, too? And he says, here's a book I want you guys to read. Going out with girls is fun. Dad, what are you talking about? You know, I'm not ready to date boys. Oh. Day, what happened to your face? Oh, this? Cut myself shaving. I had a wet dream last night. What's that? Let's start from the beginning. Hello, I'm Jim Sprague, CEO of the Pregnancy Resource Center in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Congratulations and thank you for purchasing the whole sex talk. This six session DVD series and study guide is a biblically based resource for you as a parent, a grandparent. You can use it in small groups, you can use it in your family. It's really for anyone who has a desire to see their kids move successfully from childhood to adulthood. The whole Sex Talk DVD is based on an education program that we have used with great success at the PRC for many, many years. You may have noticed that on the cover, there's the tagline that says, dangerous, beautiful gift. Well, we believe that sex is a beautiful gift that God has given, but outside of his plan, it holds many, many dangers. And those dangers are around us and visible all the time. The prevalence of pornography in our culture, the prevalence of STDs and STIs, not to mention unwanted pregnancies and abortion that results of that, it all yields a brokenness in relationships and a brokenness in families. So that is exactly why we created this series, to give you the tools to have not just a one and done conversation about sex, but to have ongoing conversations about purity and love and God's plan for sex. In doing so, you'll be able to avoid the dangers and help them embrace sex and relationships God's way. God bless you. Rowan. I am so glad I got two hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how does our culture define sex? A lot of people they tend to say, well, it's not unless we actually like have intercourse. And like they're actually, trying to find the loophole. Yeah, so it's like, it's not the actual and thing. And say it's still not against their beliefs. I think it's pretty much anything that has to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call it that. Trying not to be crude. Um, yeah. Genitalia. Yeah. 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 Smart people words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that like really gets into emotional anything because stuff like that, it really does get really emotional no matter what happens after that. You're always kind of stuck with that in the back of your yeah, head. Yeah, the connection swarm in your brain. Yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my friend was, just had a really bad breakup with her boyfriend. And um, it was only after like three months and she'd already slept with him. And she's like, I really wish I hadn't done that. That was really stupid. Cause now, yeah. cause she's really broken up about it now. When, if she hadn't slept with him, she feels like she could have just let go and just be fine. I'm in, co I'm in college, but from high school, I know a lot of kids, they were definitely having sex and their parents didn't know. Most kids go to school and back to school every day. A lot of them go by themselves, mm -hmm. either they drive or they walk. Or they get a ride home from a friend. Or whatever, yeah. And then you really have no, as a parent, I'm not a parent, but as a parent, they would really have no clue 
what happens in between school and the house. Where you're going with and where they're And where you're going and how long you're out. Yeah. Because a lot of them don't even get home from work or wherever they're at until after their kid's home. Well, I mean, with things like like Netflix and chill or something like that, you could just say, like, hey, I'm going to go to so-and-so's house and and watch some Netflix, like, and, yeah. parents don't really know what that's yeah. about, what it's actually saying. And like, you know, that you're gonna go over and you're gonna have <clears throat> sex or whatever with and that person. It, it doesn't always have to say that, it's like, yeah. if I was to say, yo, you wanna come Netflix and chill, and then some girl get all offensive about it, I can just be like, whoa, well, I was just like kidding, it's I actually meant just right. Netflix, that's it, that's all I wanted. So like, speaking of Netflix and chill, what are some like other codes that you guys think a lot of teenagers use because I know there's there's booty call which is pretty obvious. <laughs> what it is, but there's there's like friends with benefits, which I think a lot of parents don't understand like what that really means. It's getting sex, but it's you're not also having to deal with like the relationship aspect right. of it. Like you're friends with them, so you really don't have any obligation to hold up that relationship except for the sexual aspect of it. So have you guys like any thoughts on sexing? Is it? It's probably like the easiest thing on the planet next to porn. Yeah. You can do it in literally like 10 seconds and delete it and mm -hmm. nobody knows other than the other person. That's just really quick. There's no... Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to be like pictures either. It's just a lot of the time, like people will just say certain things and get you to think a certain way. Because a lot of parents I know, they don't check their kid's phone their cell phones yeah. or their text messages. It's and just even if they do, the kids are smart enough to delete oh, yeah. the pictures yeah. and del even like delete the history of right. it and delete it off the, even the memory the card. thread, mm -hmm. pretty much. I'm the one in my, in my house that still lives at home that my mom will ask about how to do this on the computer and how to do that on the computer. Yeah. If I'm the one who knows how to do that, there's no one that's going to be able to keep me accountable. Yeah. <laughs> like, what about Snapchat? Thoughts on that? Yeah, it makes it, it does make it really easy for sexting and things like that because mm -hmm. it just disappears in 10 mm -hmm. seconds and then exactly. it's gone. With anything like that, there's like no immediate repercussions for that. So it's like, I don't care. No one's right. going to do anything to me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you guys want some more I'm good. I'm set. Then I'm going to eat your rice. Three. One of the biggest influence in this culture is music. A lot of the rap songs, they degrade women mm -hmm. and in every single line. And then you see the guys who listen to that go out into the real world and that's how they talk about women. They call them the B words, they call them whores, sluts, whatever. I think for girls, when we listen to that kind of stuff, it's kind of like our way of saying like, that's how we should be treated. Like we start to learn like, Maybe this that's does that. need to happen. Yeah, like right. that's okay. That that's expected. That, that you don't need a. It's expected then for yeah, us like to a boyfriend that. that. Yeah, a boyfriend that's gonna you know respect you or whatever. That's just weird. People just don't see a problem with it, regardless of gender. And I think that needs to change, or else we're still we're just gonna keep going downhill with the way we treat each other. I think parents really do need to talk to their kids, and kids need to talk back ways. You gotta be like consistent with it, cause. I'm not gonna like you talking to me about something that you saw looked up on the computer. I'm not gonna enjoy that at all. <laughs> like if it, it is a big deal, you just gotta keep doing it till it's the norm for them. And I'll always like also remind your kids that it's okay that you messed up. We all mess up. I don't expect you to be perfect, but I want us to have this relationship so I can help you be better. And, and not I'll, even just like talking to them though, it's making them feel like they can talk to their parents yeah. without their parents getting royally mad. Oh yeah. About like saying just, hey, I screwed up and then their parents blow up at them. That's half the reason yeah. they don't talk to their parents. Yeah. Exactly. Don't, don't, it, to, don't have the expectation that they're gonna be, that they're gonna have already done stuff like that. Just let them know it's all right if it has happened. Yeah. And if right. you are let known, just stay calm about it. Yeah. Exactly. <coughs> all right, it's a wrap. Right. That was fun. Yeah, it's really good time.
My name is Steve Seiler. I'm the founder and director of Music for the Soul. And we use songs and stories to share the healing and compassion of Christ with people on really difficult issues, the issues that are hard to talk about, things like pornography addiction and eating disorders and suicide grief and just all manner of, of really challenging topics that we're facing in our culture. I have a, a deep ache in my heart over a, a lot of the music that is being created for our kids these days. The topics of our songs, there's been a coarsening uh, in the way that uh, sex is referred to in the way that relationships are represented. And as a result, we have kids acting out on things that they're hearing from their heroes, their musical heroes, that are very damaging, not just for, for their present, but have a long-term consequences as well. Let me demonstrate for you how powerful of an influence a song can have on somebody. Uh, when we listen to a song, we're processing the language part of the song, the lyrics, with the left hemisphere of our brain. And when we're processing the melody part and the rhythm part, we're using the right hemisphere of our brain. So our whole brain is engaged, so the song really has, has our attention. And then when you add the fact that melody and rhythm create the mnemonic device, the studies have shown that people remember as much as 90% of what they hear in music as opposed to 10% of what they're told. So when kids are hearing these messages in music, these are gonna stick with them. So it's more important than ever that those messages be messages that are positive and life-giving and inspirational rather than harming and, and negative. And it's not only songs and music that are affecting our kids. Pornographers make free material available on the internet. And our kids are seeing things at the age of seven, eight, nine, ten, that we've never even imagined exist. I mean, and I'm not exaggerating. I know some of what I'm saying, might, people might think, well, that's, that's just not true. But I think the problem that we have, particularly with the internet, is that parents are in grave denial about what's out there and what's accessible and how it is free. And within literally a click or two, your kids are looking at, at unimaginable depravity, and it's searing into their brains. Recent studies show that 17% of parents block content on, on the phone for their kids. That means that eight out of 10 kids are walking around with access to this poisonous material, literally cancer of the soul. I really feel sorry for parents today because they are up against it. We live in a sex-saturated culture. Parents ask, you know, how do I talk about sex with kids? You know, how, how do I bring it up? And that conversation, I find, has not gotten any easier over the years. And I think it, the, the piece of advice I would want to give parents is to not start there. I think we need to start early talking to our kids about love. What does love look like? Why is trust important? Why is commitment important? Why is thoughtfulness and kindness important? And so if we can talk to kids about relationship, what does a healthy relationship look like? Then I think the sex talk comes in later. Sex is mechanics. I think if we teach our kids about love and then about sex in that context, they'll have an understanding of what the real thing is. So they won't be fooled by the counterfeit. What I want parents to know, and what their kids need to know, is that you love them in a way that no one else ever has or ever will. And you are still, even when it doesn't feel like it, you are still their greatest influence. I was probably about 10 years old when my parents talked to me about sex. My dad was passing the bedroom and my brother and I were hanging out watching TV and he throws a book at me, literally, and he says, here's a book I want you guys to read. If you have any questions, go talk to your mom. That was it. That was the sex talk. The book itself talked about how your body changes with hormones, a little bit about what sex is, 
And that was it. And we just kind of laughed. My brother and I were like, okay, <laughs> that was our talk. I learned about sex from TV, movies. I found magazines um, from a relative, friends that were talking about it, that were doing it. One of my best friends growing up um, got pregnant. And she was 15 years old when she got pregnant. I didn't want my daughter to learn about sex the way I did. I didn't learn that sex was good. I didn't learn sex was meant to be enjoyable in a husband-wife relationship. I didn't know what God wanted me to do in terms of waiting. I thought sex was for getting someone to love you. And I thought that that's what women gave to men to be loved. If you're not talking to children from a parent perspective, you're gonna get it from media, you're gonna get it from the news, you're gonna get it from friends, um, and they're gonna be mixed messages. The media is telling our children sex is whatever you want it to be. Sex is a, your choice, not anybody else's choice. You can have sex without consequences. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want. And that's really um, up to you. My name's Adam Blickley. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Growing up, I really loved medicine. I loved the sciences. Came to really love OB. Loved delivering children, the miracle of it. At four o'clock in the morning, the joy, uh, the expression, the new life um, really struck a chord. So that's what kind of drew me into OBGYN. I tend to talk about sex every day, at least in the workplace. It's a little more uncomfortable at home. I've been in practice for 20 years. It's a generation. When I was first in practice, it was an unusual phenomenon to have a single mom, a mom without a husband or father involved. And now that's become really more normative. The one thing that, that has struck me as a physician is that I see the end point. Um, I see a pregnancy. I see a sexually transmitted infection. As a parent, um, I got to be more proactive. And I think that's really where the rubber meets the road is talking to your kids early before they need to see the physician, having those difficult conversations um, before they need the services of a physician. Um, that's where I've had an impact on my kids where I feel a little bit helpless by the time I see an adolescent because they've already crossed over into sexual activity, they've already crossed over into sexual transmitted infections or pregnancy. They're, they're reaping the consequences of decisions or lifestyle or education that failed them earlier. And that's really where I think as a parent, um, I had much more influence than I do as a physician. Well, if you look at statistics, kids learn about sex very early, they're curious naturally, and they start talking about the differences between boys and girls. And so a lot of children learn about sex from their peers, uh, which is scary <laughs> because you have someone who's not experienced or doesn't know teaching another one, sometimes from their older siblings. Where it should come from is parents. Parents are the most influential um, when it comes to talking about sex and what a child will do. Um, in regards to their sexuality. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we know how hard it is to have that, co that conversation. And so kids, their first encounter is usually from a friend or from a peer. An OBGYN, it's a very intimate relationship. It's based on trust. And so I would hear about their misconceptions or, of what sex is. Um, you know, it's not really sex if you're just giving them oral sex. Um, or the things that they've subjected themselves to um, because they thought everyone was doing it. I mean, we get them as young, you know, 10, 12. Unfortunately, the first time they present is 
because they have an infection or something has, you know, and it's gone far along. Um, and you can only imagine the devastation that these young girls are having. You know, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed, um, they're scared. Uh, you know, there's that look in that young lady's eyes, you know, it's just helpless. Um, I have no idea where to go from here. Women naturally want to be adored. We want people to be captivated by our beauty. Uh, we want attention. And I see a lot of young ladies who come in the office and um, they were genuinely seeking that, um, but they're just misguided and misdirected. They think that the way to get a man's attention is to bear all, is to send a, a text with them um, exposed or to, to talk a certain way or even to approach a guy. But there is something almost intangible about a young lady who comes in who has preserved herself who sees herself as someone valuable. She talks differently, she walks differently, she looks you in the eye, she could conquer the world. I try to instill confidence in parents about how much their, their child actually does listen to them and how much of an influence that actually has on behavior. It's not hard to tell when um, parents have been involved, especially when a father has been positively involved in, in a young lady's life. You know, a father um, shows them how they are supposed to respond to men and how men are supposed to treat them. Um, a father shows them the expectations that you should have from young men. People change behavior because of relationship. It, it's not because um, someone said so, or necessarily the consequences, but it's relationship that changes behavior. Parents are essential 